This is the story of Gustav Heinrich Ralf von Königswald, the German-Dutch paleoanthropologist who discovered fossils of human ancestors on the island of Java in the first half of the last century. Von Königswald lived from 1902 to 1982 and had a predecessor in the late 19th century, Eugène Dubois, a Dutch medical doctor and anatomist whose work he continued. At the time Dubois started his search in Southeast Asia, it was assumed that Europe was the cradle of humankind, with fierce discussions surrounding the Neanderthal remains from 1856. Dubois changed this Eurocentric view on human origins to Southeast Asia. In 1891, he discovered a fossil skull cap on Java and attributed them to a new hominin genus, Pithecanthropus, known as Java Man. Anatomist Eugene Dubois vowed to find the missing link between apes and humans in Asia where apes live and where limestone caves preserve fossils. He quit his career as a professor and volunteered as a military surgeon in the Dutch East Indies. Eventually, the colonial government relieved him of his medical duties, providing two civil engineers and a team of coolies to excavate for fossils. In 1891 and two, Dubois found fossils he called Pithecanthropus erectus. Its brain size was transitional between apes and humans, but its femur supported upright walking, an unexpected combination. After five years of exhibiting his fossils and publishing extensively, Dubois had won over many critics. Some European academics became nervous the cradle of humankind had to be brought back to Europe. Where else could humans have originated? Indeed, completely unexpected, a fragmented fossil skull with a lower jaw was officially discovered in a gravel pit near Piltdown in southeast England in 1912. Actually, it was fabricated, but only in the 1950s, with the invention of modern techniques for dating, it was possible to prove that Piltdown Man was a hoax. I think the Piltdown discovery was triggered by the discovery of the Heidelberg jaw from Germany. Other countries were revealing early human fossils and now even the Germans had an early human. So Piltdown I think was partly a reaction to that. Uh, and in my view, Charles Dawson was the most likely candidate for most of the material found at the site, but perhaps not all of it. And as for the long-term impact, it did affect British anthropologists for many years on their views, but in the long term, luckily, science prevailed and it was shown to be a hoax. The story continued in a totally unexpected place. A two million year old skull was discovered in 1924 in South Africa. The tongue child showed exactly opposite features from those of the Piltdown hoax from England. It had a small brain, but was clearly from a bipedal creature. Raymond Dart, a neuroanatomist, proclaimed that the origin of humans was not the big brain, but upright walking. He contradicted his colleagues in England, and therefore they simply ignored the new fossil evidence from Africa. In 1925, Raymond Dart's announcement of the Tong baby as a human ancestor from South Africa shook up the world of European paleontology. Up to that point, European scientists looked at Europe as the finishing school for humanity. But Dart now showed beyond a doubt that Darwin and Huxley were correct, that our ancient and most primitive ancestors would be found nowhere else but Africa. And at that point in time, the search for our human origins dramatically shifted from Europe and Asia to Africa that continues to lead the way. In the 1930s, potential human ancestors were known from three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Gustav Heinrich Ralf von Königswald 
took a job as paleontologist at the Geological Survey in Bandung in Indonesia in order to continue Eugène Dubois' search. In 1936, he described the fossil skull of a child from Mojokerto as belonging to the genus Homo. Von Königswald also had an idea where to solve the Pithecanthropus problem by finding more specimens of Dubois' Java man at the Sangiran Dome in central Java. In 1936, he toured the United States to raise money for continuing fieldwork. Immediately after securing a grant from Carnegie Foundation, he sent a check to his helpers to start searching. When he returned to Java half a year later, they had already found a hominin fossil in the river sediments, Sangiran 1, the first hominin lower jaw from Southeast Asia. A few weeks later, in 1937, field workers in Sangiran found a partial skull. Von Königswald took the night train from Bandung and arrived at the site the next morning. His helpers brought him more than 40 pieces. Some fragments were deliberately broken for increasing the fossil bonus, which Königswald paid for each piece. Another effect of his collection strategy was that we missed the precise find locations for most specimens, which makes exact geological dating impossible. Still, the fragments put together made a magnificent Pithecanthropus, as expected with a small brain and thick brow ridges, Zangiran II. The long-awaited discovery was celebrated with rice, salt and three dancers from the nearby village. Later, Sangiran IV came to light, a massive skull base, a skull cap and an upper jaw with relatively large teeth that clearly show the robusticity of Pithecanthropus. Until today, Sangiran yielded more than 200 hominin fossil fragments attributed to more than 40 individuals. Until today, Sangiran has contributed more than 19 individuals of Homo erectus. They represent the human evolutions during the lower and middle Pleistocene. One thing important to be mentioned here is, in spite of being out of the geographical context, these human fossils were discovered in good relations with their fauna environments and also their related implements deposited into uninterrupted sequence of geological layers since 2.4 million years ago. Since the era of Conic's world, the modern field research increases intensively on the site conducted by national and international team. Due to this modern research, the samples of early human fossils at Sangiran has significantly enlarged in number. The site has demonstrated the evolutions of human, fauna, culture, and environment for more than 2 million years ago. That is why the UNESCO has adopted the sites on their World Heritage List in December 1996. Von Königswald was invited to China to discuss his new finds with the World Authority on Paleoanthropology at the time. Franz Weidenreich had emigrated from Frankfurt to Beijing at some years before. He worked on the famous Peking Man fossils from the Shukutian cave. Von Königswald travelled to Beijing with his fossils. Some, which were found later, followed him by postal service. Weidenreich contributed greatly to the descriptions and reconstructions, even if von Königswald sometimes disagreed. Königswald contacted Weidenreich for the first time when he described the Mochokirtel child in 1936. He was seeking advice and support by a colleague with more expertise in human anatomy. In 1937, Weidenreich visited Königswald in Java. Together, they discovered the first hominid specimen from Sangeran in a basket with fossils. Two years later, Königswald returned the visit and traveled to Beijing. Those days, a ferry trip of several weeks, with all concomitants, as Weidenreich states, there is always a smidgen of typhoon. Königswald stood for three months. An important information about fossils is their geological age. 
trained as a geologist, von Königswald recognized that the Sangiran area contained older sediment layers that had originated from marine environments and overlying younger ones that were formed by river deposits, which contained fossils. He estimated the fossil layers to be at least one million years old. Volcanic activity and rising magma from deep inside the earth later pushed these deposits up, resulting in a dome-like structure, the Zangiran Dome. Rivers started to cut into the sediments where fossil fragments were buried for hundreds of thousands of years and eroding them out to the surface. Well, Sangiran has a folded dome structure. It's one of the most important area of hominin fossil sites discovery in Indonesia and also in Southeast Asia. Situated in central Java where non-marine quaternary sediments are exposed. Sangiran formation or Puchakan formation of early Pleistocene consists of lacustrine black clays and Bapang or Kabu formations of middle Pleistocene consist of conglomerate sandstones intercalated with thin layers of volcanic ash of tufts deposited by fluvial sedimentation. All these quaternary sediments reach with hominin and vertebrate fossils. More than 75% of hominin specimens in Indonesia have been found from the Sangran tube. So, Sangran has a homeland of Homo erectus in Indonesia. Von Königswald would have loved modern radiometric dating techniques, but because they were not yet invented in 1937, he used the fossil animals for establishing relative ages. Known as relative faunal dating, this method assumes that similarly evolved species are of an identical geological age. It allowed von Königswald to recognize old fauna and young fauna in Sangiran, each of them containing specific animal species. He only had to find a small fragment of a tooth of the ancestral elephant Stegodon. Immediately he knew that the site was much older than if he would have discovered the younger genus Elephas. Not all animals are good for dating, especially if regional variants existed in highly diverse ecosystems. Some are good for reconstructing the environment our ancestors lived in. With remarkable fossil discoveries in Sangram since the 1930s, we can recognize that throughout its occurrence, Homo erectus in Sangram lived with various vertebrate and invertebrate faunas. The vertebrates, in particular mammals, are typical Asiatic or Oriental faunas such as buffets, cervids, proboscis like Stegodon, Elephas, and Cynomastodon, suids, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, carnivores, and other smaller mammals. In Java, especially Sangiran, strata from different ages contains different assemblage of mammalian fossil fauna. The variation of faunal components in each strata is used as assemblage zones to distinguish between different ages. Based on multi proxies analysis such as pollen, pedogenetic, faunal components, and stabilized stuff, we can reconstruct the environment during the earliest occupation of Homo erectus was more of a swampy environment alternating with savanna. And towards the younger age, the occurrence of savanna and wooded grassland was even more prominent. Von Königswald used animal fossils from Sangiran also for reconstructing large-scale faunal connections and past animal migrations. For example, hippos lived in India, tapirs in China, yet both of them occur in the fossil faunas of Java. During glacial periods, when gigantic amounts of ice were built up, sea levels were nearly 100 meters lower than today. The shallow seawater region of the Sunda Shelf between the Asian mainland and the islands of Indonesia was dry, allowing long-distance migrations of land animals. Von Königswald imagined animal migration routes from the Asian continent to the Southeast Asian island, which could have also been used by early human hunters following their prey animals. For the immigration of the faunas, it plays uh, land bridges play um, a crucial role. I don't think it are uh, land bridges. It's more uh, island hopping because uh, some mammals never reached Java. The horse 
which is common from the symbolics, never reached Java. So there were uh, ecolog ecological or uh, some kinds of barriers which could taken by some mammals and other mammals not. So it's not it's not a land bridge, except except the uh, late Pleistocene um, extant fauna from the tropical rainforest, because a tropical rainforest cannot uh, go over a sea that must be dry, and it takes time before a tropical rainforest move from north to south. When von Königswald made his discoveries, human history was thought to reach two million years back in time. Today, we know it was about seven million years. And the human journey didn't start in Asia. Humans originated in Africa. Africa.